Lucretia Norman's was not killed by accident. She was murdered. That's what the evidence is going to show you. She was murdered by her wife. Probably one of the most important lines that really stuck out to me, hopefully this part is done. My handwriting isn't very nice, so I will rely upon that. You heard Mr. Williams say, you don't point the firearm to anything you don't want to destroy. Or if it's human, kill. And before I get into it, it's be about an hour, I want to thank you for your patience. You're on a home stretch here, and jury selection was wrong, or wrong, the trial was wrong, there were a lot of breaks. None of that is unusual in a trial of this magnitude. But for the court and the defense counsel myself, of course, appreciate it. You're here on time. We never had to wait for you. You were attentive. We watch, we see, make sure you're paying attention, and, and you were. And I thank you for that, because what you're doing is extremely important. And you're taking time away from your family your friends, your job, to be here. And you swore an oath to uphold the law. And I'm going to go through some of the law, defense went through some of the law, and of course, whatever the judge says, he's going to read the instructions, and that's the law. Not what we say, we can certainly go through and point some things out to you. And in a few hours, or maybe after lunch and you get charged in the law, you're going to have time to actually go back there and deliver. First time you've had an opportunity to talk about this case, what you saw, what your thoughts are. You're going to have a couple tools with you. You're going to have the law, which, as I said, the judge is going to instruct you on, and we're going to go through some of it here. You're going to have the evidence, testimonial evidence, physical evidence, the scientific evidence that you saw throughout this trial. And one of the biggest tools that you're your own common sense, what you know about life, what you know about relationships. When you came into this courtroom, or you came into the courthouse, you went through a metal detector. It didn't strip you of your common sense. Use it when you're thinking about the evidence, you're thinking about the testimony, and you're relating it to the law. Try to charm life. Accidentally. Reasonable doubt. You're going to hear a lot about reasonable doubt. The judge is going to talk about it. The defense talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. It's the highest standard. It's our burden, the state, to prove it to you beyond reasonable doubt. And it should be. It's a cornerstone of our society. But reasonable doubt is not some insurmountable level. The key word is reasonable doubt. Doubt. What leaves you firmly convinced after looking at all the evidence? The judge is going to tell you there's no requirement for the state's case to overcome every possible doubt. It's what's reasonable. Just because it's written down on a piece of paper and you're looking at it, does that really draw some reasonable doubt in your mind? Or not by looking at everything else that's in the case? For example, let's say you have a puzzle, it's 500 pieces, and it's a puzzle of the Eiffel Tower. And you don't know that it's the Eiffel Tower. I'm assuming that you see the Eiffel Tower and know what it looks like. You're putting this 500 piece puzzle together, and what you know, at the end, you're missing a few pieces in the puzzle. You shake the box, you're annoyed, you don't have them all. But you can see the Eiffel Tower, right? You can see the legs, you can see the legs. You're going to know beyond a reasonable doubt that that's the Eiffel Tower. Because it's what's reasonable. You're not going to look at it and say, oh, well, there's a piece missing in the sky, or maybe a piece missing in the leg. Well, I can't tell you that that's the Eiffel Tower. You make decisions beyond a reasonable doubt at all. And this is no different. And again, I'm going to go through some of the evidence. Counsel went through some of the evidence. But it's your recollection. What did you hear and what did you say? The 
judge will instruct them. So, when you go back to the deliberating room, you're going to have a verdict sheet. It's going to have questions on it. It's going to have all these different areas. Passion provocation, reckless manslaughter, aggravated manslaughter, and murder. The choice of not guilty is available on them. Of course. So when we're talking about murder, I went through the elements in the beginning of the trial. And the third element is that we have to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt that this wasn't done in some sort of heat of passion. You probably heard that word, the heat of passion killing. That's what the New Jersey's called passion provocation. We're going to have to go through elements too. And we have to prove, basically, that these elements do not exist beyond a reasonable doubt. But if we prove any one of them doesn't exist, any one of the four don't exist, then you have to find not guilty for passion provocation. So the elements, was there adequate provocation? Provocation actually in passion defendant. Defendant did not have reasonable time to cool off. And this defendant did not actually cool off. There's a subjective and an objective. Basically, what would a reasonable person do? And what this defendant did. You cannot get past the reasonable. Looking at the evidence, you cannot get past that reasonable person. And I said in my opening that there was no argument. I'm sticking by that there was no argument. And that there was no physical altercation. But that doesn't mean that the defendant wasn't angry. Or mad. You can have one person who's mad at another in a relationship. You know that from your own common sense. So, was there adequate provocation? And the judge is going to tell you, whether the provocation is inadequate essentially amounts to whether loss of self-control is a reasonable reaction to the circumstances. Was the shooting of Felicia reasonable? An ordinary person, the circumstances that were happening in that house, you saw nothing that would tell you that an ordinary person would take Nine millimeter handgun and shoot a wife in the face. Words alone do not constitute adequate provocation. The judge is going to tell you that. Significant physical confrontation could be considered. There's no evidence of any physical confrontation in this case. You're not going to see that. If you haven't seen that. So, right there, first one. Any one of these elements are shown beyond reasonable doubt do not exist or apply to this defendant. This case is not passion provocation. So the second one, did the provocation actually impassion this defendant? Again, you haven't seen any evidence of that. You have to lose self control. In almost every murder case that we have, Somebody who's angry. You don't murder somebody when you're happy. But just because you're angry or frustrated, that does not mean you lose something. Not every killing in anger is passion provocation. We know that because we have murder. We don't just have passion provocation. Again, there's no evidence to support that. So there's another element. Even though you only have to find one, certainly not. Would there be reasonable time to cool off? Reasonable, would a reasonable person under the same situation regain self-control and not take a gun and shoot someone? Again, your common sense of what you know about relationships. Bickering, there was stuff about bickering in the morning, there was stuff about clothes. Would an ordinary person who dishes one dog, would they make an argument and come back to their senses and not shoot someone or kill someone? Nothing in the case supports that. Again, yeah. another element. And with this defendant, did this defendant actually cool off? Again, there's no evidence here. There's no evidence that anybody was in passion. So going through here, in the state, and when the judge reads, he's going to read two, the first two elements, and then we've got to tell the counsel talk about two, knowing serious bodily injury that resulted in death, knowing it purposely. And the third one will be, did the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't in passion homicide? Nothing in this evidence that you've seen 
Shadow. But this defendant was so impassioned that she lost control and murdered her alone. Because just by the fact that she murdered her alone does not mean it was impassioned. So reckless manslaughter and aggravated manslaughter. The defendant calls Felicia Norman's death. Did she cause her death? There's a lot of evidence here. So that she shot her, and the reason that she died was because she, the bullet went to the head. Well, the question is why? why? What happened? I think the evidence shows us what happened. The defendant did so recklessly. So just as a thought experiment, get rid of the fact that she went for loads in my job. Get rid of the fact that she tried to dig a hole in the backyard. Get rid of the fact that she never called 911. All the things that we're going to talk about in this case. Maybe you could be left with reckless. And I'm not saying that loading a weapon inside is reckless on itself. Loading a firearm and pointing at someone is reckless. That's reckless. How many people had to come up here and say you don't do that? Or how many witnesses? Check the gun pointing at the ground to make sure there's no bullets in there. Because it's reckless. But you know what we have beyond that that brings it to aggravated manslaughter? Manifesting this extreme indifference to human life. This wasn't a situation where the defendant was in a room and kind of clicking the gun around like this and her wife happened to walk in and be shot. That's not what we have. Get in the distances and all that later on. That's aggravated manslaughter. The evidence shows it was an extreme indifference to the value of life. But now we add in everything else. So forget the thought experiment for a second. Add in all this other evidence that we're going to go through. That's how you know it's murder. That's how you know what her was, and she did it purposely and knowing it. This wasn't panicked behavior. I'm going to go through and show you why it wasn't panicked behavior and what you know from your own common sense. So here's why. The defendant caused Felicia Dorman to death or serious bodily injury that resulted in the death, and the defendant did so purposely or knowing. And again, the judge is going to read this. Although the state must prove that the defendant acted either purposely or knowing, the state is not required to prove motive. The state has proved the essential elements of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant must be found guilty of that offense regardless of the defendant's motive. You're just going to talk about circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. And he's going to talk about never being able to be inside of somebody's mind. And the law doesn't require it. There were only two people in that room. I do think there's a motive. And you know the motive just through what you know about relationships. They went through a lot of issues with possible finance and went through what they wanted to finance. They had dolls. The house was in disarray. You can look at the pictures. They were talking about bickering over the dishes and the sink. But it was the defendant that was angry. So how do we know that the defendant did this purposely? So, the phone, the timeline, the messages that you're going to see, I think give the most accurate occurrence of what happened at that, from when they woke up in the morning until the police arrived that afternoon. They would talk about you know, the other phone. There was the other phone, the Galaxy. The last communication was on the 29th. So is there any relevant information about what happened on the 6th? No, there was no text, there were no phone calls. We care about what happened on August 6th, in that bedroom, where Felicia was shot. Nine-tenths of 
10 in the morning. Text that. He texts her earlier in the morning, about 7 a.m. You see that. She responds, hey, Dad, just woke up. Yeah, everything's good. Sounds good. So she's awake. You know they're awake at 9, 10 in the morning. So the day starts. Texting with a friend. This case is in the background. Sorry. Stop charging. But you lied to get out of trouble, mm -hmm. not to get into trouble. Probably why she was saying it was an accident. And we're going to get into that. But there are things in her statement that are corroborated with the evidence. But there's a lot that's not. So, talks to her mom for 12 minutes and 20 seconds. She says, I told my mom, I had to call, she didn't have good service, so I had to call her husband right after this happened. You know what she did then? Didn't call 911. Shot my wife by accident. Didn't call 911. Didn't call anybody for help. Called somebody who never even came over. She says she called her dad. Call lasts 5 minutes and 50 seconds. Again, she, she told me she called her dad right after that. Right in this, right before 123 is when she shot her. 1.39 p.m. Hey, Tina, we're working things out. Sorry about the way. I'm going to go right to the next one. They went back and forth with each other, and she broke her new phone by throwing it at the wall. I don't know. When she says we're working things out like earlier, from earlier, sorry about earlier, she may have been wrong about something. It doesn't matter. The fact is, is that she started texting Felicia Dorman's mom after she killed her. That goes to the state of mind. Why would she say she broke her new phone by throwing it at the wall? Because she's trying to cover up. If her mother starts trying to call her phone and she's not answering it, she's covering her bases right from the beginning. She broke her new phone by throwing it against the wall. That's why you can't get a hold of her. That shows purpose. It shows intent. Everything she did shows purpose and intent. Again, 1.59. Six minutes and 34 seconds calls my mom again. What else is corroborated? 207.453. She calls her dad 14 times, all shorter than 15 seconds. Which, when you talk to our expert, he says, well, probably means the voicemail got picked up. I don't know what she said to her dad. But he didn't want to answer that phone again. And whatever it was, he didn't call 911 on his daughter. Whatever she said to him, he stopped answering her phone calls and didn't call 911. It was hours and hours later before he went to the police. Why? Did he know? What did she tell? Another call, 248, to my mom. Call us about 2 minutes and 46 seconds. Again, she can't get a hold of her dad, so she keeps calling her mom. Again, did her mom or stepdad, or her mom's husband, did they ever call 911? She told something to them that made them not want to call 911. Next to the dad, please call me. Call to Lester Z. She's still trying to get a hold of her dad. Another call to my mom, 3.04. Now we come up to 3.35. It's been almost two hours. Her wife is laying dead on the floor. At this point, she already moved her to a tarp, probably, because she went and bought two tarps, and that's the two tarps that we have that I'm going to show you. But that's not panic behavior. That's cover-up behavior. Two hours later, look, I understand. You shoot your wife or husband or significant other or whoever, partner, there's going to be some shock. There's going to be some shock when that gun goes off, and you're going to see shock there. And sadly enough, accidents do happen. Right? After those accidents, people don't go to Lowe's. You may freak out for 10 minutes. You may freak out for 15 minutes. You call your mom again. You call your mom, that's the first reaction. When they say call 911, you don't then go to Lowe's. And that's what the defendant did. There's a 
There's a Lowe's receipt. That's how we know we knew to go to Lowe's. We've got a receipt in the car. Two. Better get two tarps for this job. One's not going to cut it. One. A lot of blood. Let me get some towels. How am I going to wrap her up in the tarp? Buy this, but there was also a knife in the house. Now I can't consider myself a relatively handy person. Shop. She knew where she wanted to put her wife's body. She knew she was going to have to get through gravel and clay. Is that panic? Let me pick this shovel out because it has a particular job to do. But you know, that's not going to get it done. Let me get the other shovel. Muscle relaxers. That doesn't make you do this. Oh, I smoked a joint. My wife's upstairs. She's dead. Why don't I go to Lowe's and buy some shovels and try to bury it? Here she is. She goes to the ones right next to the self checkout. That's not panic. That's not stone. You know what that is? That's nervous. Why are you nervous? Because you just murdered your wife. And now you're in Lowe's or in public and you know what you're doing. You're buying things to conceal and bury your body in the back. And what does she do? She pays the credit card. It was over $100, I think, worth of stuff. You have the receipt. You're having videos, you can watch them again. You have all this evidence that you can look at and watch again if you want. Again, still trying to get home with your dad, 1151. Calls Lester. Call last for a minute, 16 seconds. 409. All those people that she stopped texting before her friend, they're still reaching out to her. She finally has to start texting them. Not working today, family emergency. Well, the family emergency is she just shot her. Usually, if something like that happens, you don't start sending text messages out like that. Who do you know what you do with your phone? You'd probably be more concerned about calling 911 about your life, but instead, you're texting your friends along with the cover-up so people stop contact, sorry, working things out, or family emergency. Didn't want to be disturbed while she was being involved. Finally, 512. Dad calls her back. Minute. 46. So is it not Molly? You're all familiar with Molly. It's not that big. Eight 
minutes later, he was at the police department. Hours later. Hours later. Personally. So now, the police. From 529 to 604, multiple calls to dad, 10 seconds or less. Again, he's probably not answering the phone. 605. So she spoke to her dad at 512. Maybe he told her, I'm going to the police. Who knows? But whatever it was, when she couldn't get back a hold of him, what's her first reaction? I'm going to wait, Dad. Are the police coming? She doesn't send a text message, are the police coming? Where are you? Just, I don't know what's going on, so I'm going to leave. Still, six and five hours after her wife was killed, she's still thinking about leaving. That goes towards her intention. All of this you can use to show what her intent was. And it wasn't an accident. This isn't how we act when there's an accident. There's the go back. You have added evidence still. The backpack. Filled with her drugs, weed, her prescription drugs, which we don't know what was in those bottles. All we know is there was a lot of them that was consistent prescriptions. And cash. Cash. And there's been a lot said about those pills. Just because the pills exist and the weed exists, doesn't mean you're taking them. In fact, the bottles were before when they were looking at them, when the witness had them, you could see here, somebody has beer or wine at their house in their refrigerator, are they always drunk? No. She was taking her stash for if she had to go on a run. And whether she, was, whether she had her clothes back, it doesn't matter. It was, still, it was her thought process that matters. It's by the fact she didn't have clothes. That doesn't mean anything. It was her thought. I'm leaving. Calls the dad, 15 seconds. Calls the mom, 37 seconds. But this is 6.30. What's going on at 6.30? Police are banging on her door. 6.30, she shot her wife like around one. Five hours later. She could do anything she wanted at that scene. I'm going to get into that. Police arrive, and this is what they find. Shotgun. It's what you need for this case. It's the evidence that you need. That's what the police saw, her body on the car. And they start to see blood. So we know the area of the room that she was shot. There's no blood anywhere else. That's where the blood was, right there. A little closer view, you can see it. Why didn't you hear any from blood spatter experts or fingerprints? One, it was her house, so they're not going to be fingerprinted. The you, detective you testified to that. But they're not going to do, he testified to this, the, the crime scene. They're not going to do blood spatter at a scene where it's been manipulated. She was there for hours at that point. It was clear to them that the body had been moved. What sort of evidence and investigation are they going to get out of that? Everything would be drawn in there. If, if I came up and tried to talk about blood spatter, the first thing you say is, well, the body was moved, so that doesn't mean anything. And that's why in this investigation, it wasn't done. The same as finger is not being collected. They found the parts. Again, planning. Cleaning the body. She didn't clean the body because she was sorry about kill, killing her wife. She was going to get blood all over herself. She was trying to stop the bleeding to get so the blood wasn't all over, easier to clean up. That's why she was on a tarp. That's why she cleaned the body. And as for the, the energy drinks, you're going to see those pictures. There were drinks all over that room. Room was in disarray. We don't know when. Coffee cups, we don't know when those coffee cups were put there. We don't even know if there was coffee. The room was in disarray. I don't see any houses behind there. 
I don't see any good view where anybody else could see what she was doing back there. A panicked behavior. Let's find the most concealed spot in the yard. Take my brand new shovels. And bury my wife out there. They find the shovels still in the back. She didn't stop because her wife deserved better. She stopped because how difficult was it to get in? This is August. August in New Jersey. Trying to dig through the clay and rock and gravel. It probably got exhausted. That's why she stopped. I was talking. Difference between cop and a suspect in a homicide investigation. Nowhere does it say you have to wait 48 hours to talk to someone who's a suspect in a homicide. How much information would you need to not your game if the police had to wait 48 hours? Police officer shootings are a different situation. Accidental shootings of a police officer. If there was a chance that a police officer was getting charged with murder, they wouldn't be waiting 24 hours or 48 hours in any office. She's a suspect in the homicide investigation. They showed up at her house and found her wife's body on the park. Nothing to these officers when they started interviewing her pointed toward the accident. She's right at Miranda rights. You're going to see that if you watch the statement. The officer goes through each question. Yes, yes, yes. She didn't want to talk to him. Even when he was done, he followed up again. He goes, are you sure? Yes, I'm willing to talk to you. And don't lie if you're in trouble. You lie if you're out of trouble. Her lies got more elaborate. I'll use that word, more elaborate. Than really, they got less elaborate as, because when she went in, she didn't know what the police meant. She just knows that they were at her house. This one didn't go. I think that looks like yours. Um, so, her lies are getting more elaborate as she finds out that the police know more. She doesn't know. It's, a one, it's one way in. It's the way they're supposed to be. So in the beginning, she's saying this and this and this. So if you lie to get into trouble, if you lie to get out of trouble, you don't lie to get into trouble. So as the statement goes on, you're going to go through it, and the cops start giving her more information, she starts giving more information back. Because she knows now they know. But she's stuck with the accident story. We know from all the other stuff in the case that that's not what happened. And there was no yelling during this interview. He wasn't berating her. They were having a conversation. They talked about her education. They talked about her work. It's part of taking, doing an interrogation. You want to get a rapport with the person. They're usually more truthful that way. You're not going to get much out of somebody if you're yelling at them. When you watch the statement, the statement speaks for itself. Is she intoxicated? There's no indication in that statement. She was coherent. She was upset. I'm not going to. No doubt about it, she was upset. Her wife's dead, and she did it. Of course she's going to be upset. When you do something wrong, you also can have regrets about it. That doesn't mean you didn't do it. Just because you have regrets and you're upset. But again, it was inconsistent. Some of the things that I pointed out in mind say, well, she was telling the truth. I have pages of it, and I'll just pick out some. Right off the bat, how many guns?
guns you have in the house? Her answer, that's the main gun. That's the gun that I've seen. Did she mention the other gun? Did she mention she had a backpack with a Ruger in it? No. Because again, this is the beginning of the statement. She doesn't know what the police know. I don't own a gun, so it was her gun. She can't load it. They showed her at the shop a bunch of times, but for whatever reason, she always has trouble loading it. Again, showed her at the shop. She talks about this range, going to the range and shooting and not having a membership. But yet, she wants you to believe that her wife has no idea how to load her gun. And instead, I'm going to get, you know, I'm Felicia, and I'm going to give the gun to my wife, who doesn't know anything about guns, to load it for me. That match up with what you know about your common sense and about firearms and the danger of firearms. If that's someone who goes and uses them and goes to gun shops, is going to do it that way. Yeah, it goes into the question: Why was the gun? You know, they why was it loaded at three ten, three p.m.? We wanted to go out for the day, so you take the gun with you. No, we get it done for the night time, so when we come home, we can have a night and go to bed. It doesn't get reloaded because it stays. We don't. You know, we don't use it, but they do use it. It gets moved around the house all the time. They go to the range with it. They go to their mom's house and shoot it in the woods. This isn't the first time she shot this gun. She wanted. To, she was playing like it was, but she knew nothing about the gun. She was trying to distance herself from that gun the best she could, because if she didn't, it wouldn't have fit in with her accident story. Detective says, and what time did you leave the house after that? Answer, I never left the house. <coughs> after you sh after that, you shot her. You never left the house? No. She did leave the house. She went to Lowe's. She didn't know the detective knew that at the time. So she lied about it. Again, it's getting more elaborate. She's going to have to fill in more gaps in her story as the police Is give her... No, I speak no objection, but I'm not interested in the Asked about 911. She said, I just wanted a couple extra minutes. And again, I said a little bit, I get a couple extra minutes. We did this, it was an accident. Hours. Hours later. Question. Tarps were in the basement? Yeah. Okay. Is that where the shovels were? Yes. Another lie. Shovels were in the basement. Tarps were in the basement. There, there were probably some tarps in the basement. The back area, those tarps have been there for a while. I'm sure they had tarps around the house. These tarps weren't in the basement. Finally, once she's confronted about leaving and where she went, she says that she went. So the question, okay, after that happened, you left the house to go get the shovel in the park. Is that correct? The one, yes. Went to Lowe's, did you pay cash? The question, how many did you buy? One. Again, another lie. She says, I bought one shovel. Then finally says, she bought one. At first tells the detective she didn't know. She says, honestly, I don't know why I bought them. Then Sometimes you gotta ask again. And you ask again, then she gets into the purpose for the two different shovels. Let's look at her demonstration that she done. In this demonstration, she's not loading the gun. If, uh, if you don't mind, can you stand up for a second? I just want to here, remove the chair and for a second, okay? And I just want to get an understanding. Matt's going to come over here and sit on the ground for us, okay? I know. It's okay. No, 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 relax. This is what we're working with you. We're helping you out, okay? What I just want you to know is, so, she's sitting over there, right, where Matt is, okay? She's sitting there. Tell me about how all of a sudden... No, I don't think that's right. Move, move further. Move further. Like, 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 Going down this way. So that's so she almost looked. She had the, the door was like right. Okay. All right. And which way is the closet? Oh, we have two closets. Okay. 
that sits. And you're sitting on the what part of the bed were you sitting on? On the bed was on my so you're close, your side's closest to the door? Yeah. Okay, you're sitting there, and she's over there, right? So then you look, look at her, and she, so what happens at this point? How, how do you get the gun at this point? Like, you guys, like, she's over there. Where I the go, no, I loaded the gun. Yeah, you loaded the gun. At where I was sitting. How, how did you get the gun? She hit, but she handed me the gun to load it. So, but she's over there. She was right. sitting down, right. then walked over after we discussed it, got it by her bed, got the bullets, came back, gave it to me, then turned around and sat back down. Okay, then you sat over here. Then I went back to the bed, yes. You went back to the bed, then what happened? That's when I sat and just hit it on my thigh. You had it on your thigh. And clip them in. And how many rounds did you put in the uh, magazine? Somewhere between seven and nine, I'm guessing. Because okay, so there's no reason for her to be that. And what are you guys talking about at this point?
co-investigator, Karkowski came in. He's the one that did the camera test and, and the throw and the film to it. Took the Springfield XTM, 9 millimeter handgun that was found in the house. Located by our body. Same firearm that the defendant told the cops she used to kill Felicia. He took the same ammunition. So there was testing on that ammunition. It was tested, it was fired. We're going we're gonna to fire every single one of them, just fire away all the evidence, but they were fired. It was during the panel test. And he did them at all these different distances. Decided to do this. This is how all kinds of different law enforcement agencies do this. So, six inches. You can see all the sniffling. And you're going to have this back here. Six inches. All you can see it all over this camera. And the further away you get, as you sit. That's how they determine the distance. Again, 12 inches. <coughs> you can see all the sibling coming forward. <coughs> this is a science experiment. <coughs> 18 inches. Still, it's getting fainter and fainter as you get further away. And you can still see. Still. And when we talk about the firearm for the defendant, the defense counsel brought up, talk about after 18 inches, it can be indeterminate. But that's because when you start to get further away, you start to see less stippling, which is why you can't tell from too far away. It doesn't mean it's impossible. Because you can even see, when you have this in the back, you can see faint little stipples on the one from 24. You have to look very closely, you don't need a magnifying glass to see how spread out they are. You're going to have this when you go back there. <coughs> information on the distance. You look at 30 inches, and you see nothing. You look as closely as you want. Same firearm, same ammunition. This red mark right here? What was the evidence? Here? It's red. So you're going to have those back there with you. You heard from Dr. Hood. about an exit wound because there was no exit wound. If there was an exit wound, when, he, when Dr. Hood was talking about the wound, he would have said, I saw an exit wound. <laughs> so you find the light core inside of the head, on the back, you start to see, and then we get into the bullet when we talk about the ballistics and why maybe you saw some of the core and why maybe some of it didn't add up. You have the downward trajectory of the bullet. Computers protected. Um, so you have the down trajectory of the bullet. Again, not for shock value. If I had shown it, there would have been a question of why it wasn't shown. But you see the down trajectory of the bullet. He identifies stippling on her face. 
Spittle, medical examiner for decades. Philadelphia. He's done autopsies on gunshot wounds. Stop writing a book because he's busy doing thousands and thousands and thousands of autopsies. Seeing the sibling isn't something new to Dr. Hood. And you can see, you're going to have this back with you. And you can see the burn marks, the stippling on her face, and he measures it out to the four inch diameter. When you have this back, you're going to be able to see the marks. And you take those and you compare them to this. And again, it's not a science problem. You can do this yourself. And you're going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to go back there and look at this picture and look at it. Use the panels, in terms of the barrel of the gun is approximately 18, 22 inches. <coughs> Let's just take a look to see how close that is. Do you, do you mind giving him for the chair? So, the defendant says about five or six feet. So we'll go up here to like 70 inches. Even that's too close to pointing on somebody. Twenty-four inches. The furthest out, Doctor Hood said. Look at how close. That's how close. Okay. The barrel of the gun was to Felicia's face. The last thing she saw before she died. Pointing a firearm at a person's face, eighteen to twenty-two inches, is purposeful. Act. Oh, I want to talk about just briefly again with the rigor at the time. Rigor is not an exact, story. it's a range. It's not one of these things like, oh, Person dies, start start the start the clock, and at exactly four hours, regular sets of time. So I walk. Background. There's other factors that come in. Temperature is warm. Again, August, hot. The body is getting moved around. We have the text messages. That's how you know the time of death. Dr. Hood didn't put a time of death because he couldn't determine the time of death. He put it on there to where this is some kind of bureaucratic, whatever his explanation is. We have. Dave Blinks. He inspected the firearm, he did the visual, technical, and the functional firearm. Oh. Dr. Hood, also, there was a lot of questions to Dr. Hood about the ballistics. He wasn't on ballistics expert. He was here for pathology. And that's who the state's depending on when they talk about the bullets. An expert. And the recall on the XDM, or there was a recall on the XDS, it's a different gun. If there's a recall on a Ford F 150, there's not a recall on a Ford 350. They're different 
guns. It has nothing to do with each other. They're mutually exclusive. And when I asked him after he did the test, at the end of his testimony, did you see anything in that gun that you thought there needed to be a recall or something was wrong with that gun? No. He took it apart. He did all the inspections. No defects or, or uh, anything wrong with that gun. Again, it won't fire. gun will not fire unless all of the safeties. There is a trigger safety. When you have the gun back there, you're safe. You can move it. And then this trigger has to be pulled all the way back for it. That's how you know this pistol. It's not an accident. You have to do all this. You have to pull the trigger for it to go click. And you just heard that. How far back you have to pull that trick. Also, this has to be all the way forward. If this is back, the gun won't fire. There's a grip safety, there's a trigger safety, 6.84 pounds. That's how hard you gotta pull that trigger for that gun to go bang. And again, all the safeties must be suppressed. When you heard it was an accident, that's why I get sent down to Springfield to make sure that this gun was working properly. To make sure that when we presented this case to the jury, there was two experts that were talking about the gun and how it was working properly. Pressing both safeties and pulling a 6.84 pound trigger is a purposeful and intentional act. It doesn't happen. State Police Forensic Firearms Identification. Metal casing found inside the Springfield. Let me see if it's much of a surprise. Was fired by the Springfield. You saw the pictures and you saw the examination. Now, I'm going to talk about the discharge for that. It was still in there. I asked, have you ever? He's fired thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds. And he has experience that a shell was stuck in the gun. <coughs> It's, the gun still fired properly. The, the bullet casing gets ejected after the gun is fired. It doesn't mean that the gun malfunctioned in the shooting process, and it doesn't mean that the bullet was defective. You know how we know that the bullet wasn't defective? Because it did what it was designed to do. That's why we're here. Tool mark on that bullet. It wasn't there when it was loaded because it wasn't effective. That tool mark is created, as the expert showed, when you pull this trigger, the gun goes back, if the slide goes back, which is supposed to eject the shell, and then go forward. When it went forward, that's when it lifts the bullet up to replace it, so you can shoot again. That's why it's a semi-automatic. But the shell casing that was stuck in it stopped it from lifting the, the bullet up, which is what created that forward moving tool mark. But this all happens after the gun was already fired. So it has nothing to do with the bullet that was fired that killed Felicia Williams. And again, he testified that that tool mark would not inhibit that gun from going off. And it would not create a misfire. Again, 30, they, he could look at this, the uh, bullet, he says a 38 caliber gun, and this is a 38 caliber class gun, a 9 millimeter shoot size. And as for the weight of the bullet, he said the bullets expand, things happen when they hit the flesh. Is there a point, 25% missing or whatever the number is? Well, we know the bullet fragments were going all over the place, that's why it was found in the blood and added in the back of Felicia's hair. The body, the scene, everything was manipulated there. Manipulated by the defendant. So that tiny little metal, you're going to see how small the pieces are. 
could have fallen under the bed, could, could have gone anywhere while that body was being moved. And taking a picture after the body was picked up and moved off the tarp, Detective Wood also testified when there were questions about well, why didn't you take any pictures when you lifted up the bed. If there's nothing, nothing of evidentiary value here, you can take a picture. So if nothing was found underneath there, we have a picture. Again, pressing the safeties, pulling that trigger, is a purposeful and intentional act. This is not passion provocation. Could it be aggravated manslaughter, pointing a gun at someone's face, extreme indifference, the value of life? It could be if we didn't have all this other evidence in this case. That's what elevates it to murder. Mar Lucy purposely and knowingly killed Felicia Boyman on August 6, 2017. This was not an accident. This is not an accident. A bullet wound to the face of 18 to 22. Gentlemen, we're going to uh, take our break at this time. We're going to break five of you to come back at 2.15 for, uh, for my charge on the law. You're not to discuss this case with anyone, not the other jurors, not even the spouse or close friend until this trial is over. And you are charged by being on the law and instructed to begin your deliberations. Then you may discuss the case only with each other and only when the 12 of you are in the jury deliberation room. You're not to read or listen to any television, newspaper, or other account of this trial or case, and you may not conduct any internet or any other personal research or investigation. Do not communicate with anyone about this case on your cell phone, and you are, or any other electronic means, and you are only to consider the evidence seen and heard in the courtroom, and only discuss the evidence during deliberations while at your collective assurances.